if you would open your Bibles with me to Numbers chapter 6 this morning. Numbers chapter 6. And uh, I'm just going to read, oh, I guess about six verses. This is a beautiful passage of Scripture. Numbers chapter 6. Did you know God desires to bless you? It's amazing how many people I've talked to as a pastor who uh, feel they're not worthy or they're unblessable. And it's not that you're worthy. It's that he is that good of a God. I'm in Numbers chapter 6. Go down with me to verse 22. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. How many of you could use some blessing this morning? Yeah, let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful, wonderful scripture and thank you that you have a heart to bless your people. I pray that you will be present with all who hear this message this day and that you will let them sense that you are blessing them as you fulfill this scripture in their hearing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This is, uh, this is an instruction that God gave to Moses for Moses to give to Aaron and his sons who were priests. In fact, there's, there may be a heading in your Bible that may refer to this passage as the priestly blessing. And it was the priest who would give it, but it was God's blessing. And this is how God wanted the priests to, to bless his people or, or to bestow God's blessing on God's people. And um, this was a, a, a privilege that God gave to the priests to do. And most of you don't call me priest. Um, today in the Catholic Church and in some of the more liturgical churches, um, they still use the title priest. I am a Protestant pastor. We tend to use the title pastor or or even bishop. Uh, in fact, in my denomination, I am ordained as a bishop. That's my official title of ordination in the church that I belong to. But for the most part, people call me pastor. But several years ago, I had a friend that I used to work with and who he and I actually went through the police academy together many years ago, um, and he was Catholic. And he knew I was a minister, a pastor, but he was Catholic, and so every time he would see me, he would call me Father. In fact, it was, it was kind of funny. He was, I think he was Hispanic or some, you know, he had a little accent to his English, and so it usually came out Fodder. And so every time he would see me, he would say, hey, father, how you doing? And I never corrected him. Um, but, and neither was I ever offended by being called father. Um, you know, I just I knew in his mind and in his heart, he was he was honoring me. He was respecting the office of my calling uh, as a pastor. And uh, he was respecting me. 
in, in that. Well, just as priests were the spiritual leaders of God's people in the Old Testament, so are pastors the spiritual leaders of God's people in the New Testament, and particularly in uh, Protestant churches. So uh, just as it was the privilege of the priests to pronounce or bestow God's blessing on the people then, it is my privilege and even my responsibility to pronounce or bestow God's blessing on his people today in the church, those who are saved. And so I've come, to, I've come to bless you in the name of the Lord today. <laughs> Hallelujah. How many of you could use that, use some blessing? I was thinking, you know, we've had some tough days in the past few weeks, months, maybe years. Um, we've watched as war has waged in the world and and recently we've seen devastating storms that have caused so much death and destruction in the world. And, you know, living down here has been plagued with troubles and trials of all kinds. And then you add on top of the many uh, major events, the, the personal things that people are going through, sicknesses and diseases and uh, you name it, financial struggles, the personal problems. And so I thought today would be a good day for me to stand in front of you as a pastor and bestow God's blessing on you who are believers. I didn't come to preach a discouraging word to you today. So I've come, to, I've come today uh, to bless you. This is a day of blessing. I want to get into this message, I want to talk about the blessing. The blessing, it's something that uh, we see in a number of places in the Bible. In fact, it's very important to the Jewish culture. The fathers would often, before they would pass from this earth, would lay their hands on their children and bless them. Uh, this particular blessing is the priestly blessing that God told them to give to his people. And I wanna, I'm gonna talk about three things. I wanna talk about first the benediction. <laughs> I'm gonna start with the benediction. And then I'm gonna talk about the nature of God's blessing. And then I wanna talk to you about bearing the name of God. And so let me start with benediction. And uh, When I was a child, I remember my dad telling a story about the long-winded preacher who got up one Sunday and told his congregation, I'm going to be preaching a sermon today on the whole book of the Bible, the whole Bible. I'm going to start in Genesis. And I'm going to end in Revelation. And he preached his heart out. And after about an hour and a half of preaching, he said, well, this brings us up to the book of Isaiah. What are we going to do with old Isaiah? And one elderly man in the congregation stood up and said, Pastor, Isaiah can have my seat. I'm going home. This passage of scripture in the book of Numbers chapter 6 and a few other passages that are similar are sometimes referred to as the benediction or a benediction. And when I was a boy growing up in church, I didn't really know what a benediction was. I thought of a benediction as just the ending of the preacher's sermon. And so as a boy, if I'm honest with you, I was always kind of probably happy when the pastor got to the benediction. <laughs> All I knew was it was the end of the sermon, the church service was about over, and we could go eat lunch soon. And a benediction is an ending in the sense that it is typically given at the end of a religious service. But it's more than just an ending. It is the bestowing of God's blessing on someone or something. It is the giving of an invocation 
whereby you invoke God's favor and blessing on some activity or some person or people. And I like to think that the placing of it at the end of something, the end of a religious service or ceremony, is somewhat like putting a period on the matter. Or maybe, maybe more like putting an exclamation point on it. And so let me, let me show you what I mean by that. If you were just reading through the Bible from front to back, the first five books of the Bible you would read are called the Pentateuch. How many of you have ever read through the Pentateuch? A couple of us. I'm talking like straight through. I'm sure many of you have read in the Pentateuch. Um, and if you were to read that, the book of Genesis, you know, the first one will lay out some important historical information that you need to know. Ending in Exodus chapter 1 with the story of how God's people ended up in slavery in Egypt. And you would see then in Exodus chapter 2 and 3 how God called Moses to lead them out of bondage into the land of promise. And then if you were just reading through the Bible from front to back, as you get further into the book of Exodus, you'd see plagues. Plagues that God sent on Egypt. And you'd see the awesome and powerful hand of God as Aaron's staff becomes a snake. You'd see God's awesomeness in the plague of blood and the plague of frogs and gnats and flies and boils and the plague of hail and locusts and the plague on livestock and the plague of darkness and the plague on the firstborn. You'd see the Passover and all the restrictions of the Passover. And as God leads them out of bondage, you'd see all of the intricate instructions, the details that God gives them about the tabernacle and the articles of the tabernacle and all of the various offerings and sacrifices they had to bring to offer at the tabernacle. You would see all of the rules and regulations concerning all of the ministry in the tabernacle and how they were to approach this holy and omnipotent God of all creation. And then you'd read about all the laws of God, not just the Ten Commandments, but laws concerning just about every matter of life that you can think of. He gave them laws of festivals and feasts, laws of social responsibility, laws of justice and mercy. You'd read about all of the regulations concerning the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering, the regulations concerning the courtyard, the oil for the lampstand, even the rules concerning the priestly garments. He even gave rules to the priests that the 12 tribes of Israel would be etched on some of those garments and they would bear the names of all of the tribes as they went in to the presence of God. Even if you knew nothing about God, by the time you get far, far into, very far into the book of Exodus, you would soon grow weary of reading about all of the laws and regulations and restrictions and instructions that God gave his people. And it would soon seem that this God is so holy and so supreme and so magnificent in glory and righteousness that no one could ever hope to keep all of these laws good enough to satisfy a God like this. In fact, if you want to know how to witness to people of any other religion in the world, ask them if they are good enough to keep the law in their religion perfectly. 
Because ours is the only faith, the Christian faith is the only faith I'm aware of in the world that acknowledges I can't do this good enough to save myself. Well, then just as you were growing tired of reading about all of those laws, regulations, restrictions, and instructions, you would come to the incredible book called the book of Leviticus. I mean, the book of Exodus ends with the cloud of God's presence covering the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filling the tabernacle to the point that even Moses himself could not enter the tent of meeting. And now you would come to the book of Leviticus, which goes into great detail about what is called the Levitical law. It's full of God's laws about burnt offering, about the grain offering, laws about the fellowship offering, laws about the sin offering, regulations about the guilt offering. It covers the laws of clean and unclean foods. It even had laws about what food you could eat and what food you could not eat. In this book, God gives us his laws about purification and regulations about infectious skin diseases. Did you know there are even laws concerning the regulations about mildew in your home? Are you hearing me? Some of you are probably thinking to yourself, I hope God doesn't look in my shower. There are laws about sexual relations. Laws, there are laws for priests. I haven't, haven't lost you yet with all these laws, have I? It gives instructions concerning the Sabbath and the Passover, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles. I'm telling you that if you're just reading through the Bible from front to back, once you get past some historical information in Genesis, it won't take you long to realize that God is holy and righteous and magnificent and omnipotent and sovereign and man is not and you'll soon come to understand that there are a lot of rules and regulations and instructions that God gives that God's holiness requires of his people in fact there are so many of these laws that it's no wonder Romans 3 verse 20 says that no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. I'm kind of glad that's in the Bible. It goes on to say, rather, though the, uh, through the law, we become conscious of sin. I mean, all those laws that you read through in the Pentateuch Really what they do is make you aware of the fact that you and I are sinners. Amen. Boy, when you start getting a little too self-righteous for your own good, you need to go back and read through the Pentateuch. I, I, can, I think I can speak for all of us when I say that none of us can keep all of those laws of this holy God good enough to be, de to be declared righteous in his sight. As, as you read through all of those laws, they just make you aware that you and I are nothing but sinners, lost and undone, in need of a Savior who will show forth his grace to us. When the great apostle Paul, <clears throat> who, by the way, was a Pharisee among Pharisees. Now, in case you don't know, that means he was pretty good at observing the law. He made it his life's goal to keep all of the law. And he wrote this about this whole law thing once he became acquainted with the Lord and grace and mercy. And I love how he described this. He said, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. 
I know that nothing, he said, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good. In other words, I desire to obey the law of God, but he said, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Now listen, I'm so thankful he said this. Who will rescue me? Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You understand that Jesus Christ and his righteousness is the only hope you and I have concerning the law of sin and death. Amen. You can just almost imagine this great Pharisee reading all through Exodus and all through Leviticus, struggling with this battle of loving God's law, but just not being able to be good enough to obey it perfectly. I'm telling you that if you were reading through the Bible, and if all of this was God's sermon to you, by the time you get to Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27, you would be thrilled to get the benediction. Because you see, the benediction isn't just the ending of the sermon. It is the bestowing of the blessing. This, this great and awesome God, magnificent in holiness, wonderful in majesty and glory, looks down on his fallen people knowing that they will never be able to keep all of these laws that his righteousness and holiness demand. And this, law, this God speaks to Moses and says to him, be sure you tell the priests that this is how I want you to speak my blessing over my people. God wanted you and me to know that he's not just a holy God who delights in the destruction of those of us who are sinners. He delights in blessing, even sinners. <laughs> Whew. Those of us who will never be able to keep all of his laws. He doesn't just write you off as lost and hopeless. He wanted, he wanted them to know. He wanted to bless them. That's the benediction. It's the bestowing of God's blessing on his people who do not deserve it. And I've come to bless you today in the name of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me, let me talk about the nature of God's blessing on your life. This is how I want you to bless my people. He said, say to them, and he told them exactly what to say. You know, <clears throat> if ever there was a blessed nation, it is the nation of Israel. God has blessed that nation more than any nation on planet earth. Do you understand that if, if it was not for God's blessing on the nation of Israel, we would have no grace today. Amen. In fact, we would not have the word of God. God gave his word to his people Israel. We would have no Bible if God had not blessed this nation like that, there would be not even a savior for sinners like you and me. <laughs> I mean, the savior came from the nation of Israel. God gave the nation of Israel his word. He gave them the land of promise. He blessed them with the Messiah. Even Jesus made the statement that salvation is of the Jews. God brought about his plan of salvation by blessing the nation of Israel. 
So God had greatly blessed them. Now he had promised Abraham that I will bless you and you will be a blessing. And this blessing not only belongs to the Jews of the Old Testament, it belongs to us as well who are saved by the blood of Jesus who have been made descendants of Abraham. That's why Ephesians chapter one, verse three says, praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So before I get very far into the nature of this blessing, I want you to first understand this blessing belongs to you and me today as much as it belonged to God's people uh, the day that he spoke this to Moses. It is amazing to me as a pastor how many times I have talked with people who really don't feel blessable. When I tell them God wants to bless you and they say, oh, pastor, I don't deserve his blessing or I, I, I don't think he can bless me because of what I've done or what I have failed to do. They don't feel worthy to be blessed. And I'm telling you, you're not. This is not about you earning God's blessing. <clears throat> now, first, re regarding the nature of this blessing, there is the fact that this is a personal blessing. And what I mean by that and what I want you to see is this is, this is an individual blessing. God, wants, God sees individuals. I mean, he blesses nations, but I want you to see the individual aspect of this blessing. In this passage of scripture, in verse 27, God made a promise to bless the nation. When he said in verse 27, I will bless them in that promise, there is a plural pronoun that's used, and that is a promise to the nation. But in verses 24 through 26, the way the priests were to speak this over the people, I want you to notice that the pronouns that are used are singular. God did that. By the way, we live in a world where people seem confused about pronouns. I just want to remind you that God is not confused about he, him, she, her, they, them. God wants you to know that not only does he bless a nation, but God desires to bless the individual. God's blessings will come to you personally. This is a personal blessing. God is instructing the priests not just to bless the nation, but to bless the individuals. So God has a personal blessing for you. I want you to wrap your mind around that. God is a personal God. God knows you. Did, did you realize that God even knows your name? Jesus, Jesus made the statement that the shepherd calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. In, in another place, Jesus told us to rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Amen. So, so in, in fact, in the very next chapter, if, if I were to read chapter seven, which you can thank me later that I didn't because it's the longest chapter in the Pentateuch. But if you read through chapter seven, you, you'll just, if, if you're reading through the Bible, you get to this chapter, you'll think it's just a long list of names of leaders of the various tribes of the people. And there is this repetitious list of animals they brought to be sacrificed. And, and you, would, you would think that it's just, just redundant. Each leader would bring 21 animals for a total of 252 animals. And if you read this long list, I, I, I just want to point out that you will notice, you'll see that God takes the time to record the name of each individual and each gift that person brought. As repetitious as it may be to read through it, it shows us that God sees the individual in the crowd. See, see we live in a world 
that where it's just so easy to feel lost in the crowd, to feel lost in this world. But with God, nobody is ever lost in the crowd. God sees you. He knows your name. He knows your need. God sees the individual believer and he wants to bless you personally. I don't think I can preach that any better. Can somebody say amen? Then there's the second thing about the nature of this blessing. And I just want to go through this quickly because it's there's the if if you notice, there is this threefold aspect of the blessing that God bestows. And it's seen in three verses, verse 24, verse 25 and verse 26. I want I don't want to complicate it. I don't want as I like to say, I don't want to complicate this by elaboration. I don't want to complicate this by explanation. So it's really simple. Let me just keep it simple. Let's take it one verse at a time. In verse 24, here's what you're to say to the people when you bestow my blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. In a world that really does not care about you, God takes great care of you. That's what that means. He watches over you. To care for you in every way. That that one verse means that God cares about your feelings, your emotions. He cares about your hurts. He cares about your joy. He, He cares about your struggles. He cares about your safety. To to keep you means just that. God wants to bless you by keeping you no matter what you go through. In verse 25, the priests were to say this. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. What does a shiny face mean? Have you ever seen a a baby? I love baby smiles. Have you ever seen those cute faces that just, or the face of someone who's happy? It's been suggested that this refers to God smiling at us. You ever picture God smiling? Or do you just have this image of God as being this great, big, mean, holy, judgmental? And he is holy and judgmental. But I just want you to pause and think for a minute that God smiles. And and this passage of Scripture speaks of God smiling at us. After reading through Exodus and Leviticus, it would be like a breath of fresh air to see God smiling at us when we need His grace. Because grace is connected here. Imagine this holy and awesome God smiling at you as He bestows upon you His grace. And then in verse 26, the priest would say this. The Lord turned His face toward you. And give you his peace. I I, I think I like this one the most. Everybody look at me just a moment. Has anybody ever been upset with you, mad at you? And you walk into the room, or maybe you run into them at the store, and you say, hi, and you get this. Has anybody ever turned their face away from you? Well, then this one doesn't need any explanation. Have you ever called anyone just to have them screen your call and not answer? It's even worse when it's in person instead of over the phone. You run into them, call out their name, they turn away and ignore you. Well, imagine if you were in real trouble and in need of real help, And when you call someone you trusted, instead of giving you a hand, imagine if they turn away their face from you. Because in this verse, God is telling you, I will never do that to you. No, part of God's blessing to you is that he will always, listen to me, pay attention to you when you need him. And you call, and he turns his face to you, and when he does, he will give you his 
peace. You see that? That's a, that's a powerful word in Hebrew. It's shalom. And it refers not, not simply to the absence of troubles. It is the quietness of your heart in the middle of the trouble. It's not the absence of storms, but the calmness that he will give you in the middle of of the storm. Jesus is a picture of this as he sleeps on the boat in the storm. I often say that peace is not the absence of the storm, it's the presence of a person who is called the Prince of Peace. And God said, when you call on me, I will turn my face to you, I'll pay attention to you and give you my peace. God said, tell the priests, that's how I want them to bless my people. Let me kind of wrap things up a little bit. Thirdly, by talking about bearing the name of God. You see, like a, like a period on the end of the blessing, God tells them in verse 27, that when the priests bless the people like this, they will put my name on my people. Do, do you know, did you know that you... As a believer, you bear the name of God? A name that the Jews considered too holy and sacred to even write completely. And, and if you know that you bear the name of God, do you know what that means? To bear someone's name indicates that you belong to them. Just as a wife bears the name of her husband, and just as a son bears the name of his father. In fact, growing up in a town where everybody knows everybody, for the first 30, maybe 40 years of my life, I wasn't known just as Todd Steffi. When I told people my name, they would say, oh, you're, you're Marlon's son. Now my sons tell me that they meet people and when they hear their name, they go, oh, you're Todd Steffi's son. Or, or sometimes it's, oh, you're Marlon and Ruth's grandson. <laughs> So bearing someone's name indicates that you belong to them. Do you understand that you belong to God? Whew. And when you belong to someone, that means they take care of you. Like a husband takes care of a wife or like a father takes care of his son, God puts his name on you and you belong to him. And because you belong to him, God will take care of you. There's a scripture over near the end of your Bible in Revelation chapter 3 where Jesus said, I am coming soon. He said, hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Amen. And him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. You see, the pillars of God's temple are not made of stone. The pillars of God's temple are faithful people who bear his name. You belong to God. You bear his name for all eternity. Amen. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1, to his weary people, God spoke through the prophet and said, Fear not, for I have redeemed you, and I have called you by name. You are mine. God knows your name. You belong to God, and he calls you by name. And there's one more thing I need to tell you before we leave this place. Not only do you bear God's name, but did you know that he also bears your name? 
Have you ever had an experience where something very important comes up um, and you grab an ink pen to write a note for yourself? Because this is important. It's something you have to do. It's something you cannot forget. You grab a pen to write yourself a note and you search around only to discover that you don't have a piece of paper to write on. Have you ever had that experience? Yeah. What do you do? You, if you do like me, you write it on the palm of your hand, right? Because that's a visible place. Every time you reach for something, you'll see it. It will remind you. You won't forget it. When Isaiah 49 Verses 15 and 16, God assures his people with these words. Listen, this is beautiful. He said, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will never forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. And God doesn't just have your name written somewhere in a book in heaven. He has you engraved. That means carved into the palms of his hands so that he will never forget you. And I don't know, maybe, maybe someone's watching our program that needs this, but I just want to tell you, God's hands are big. And there, there is always room for one more name to be engraved there. And if that's you, you just need to accept his blessing today of his son and your savior. God won't forget you. And he wanted me to bless you today with this blessing. So if you would stand with me. And I want you to just kind of lift your hands to receive the blessing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. Hallelujah. Peace. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray this blessing over your people, all who have heard this message. I pray that your favor would be bestowed upon them. I pray that you keep them, bless them. Let your face truly shine upon them be gracious to them, Lord. Turn your face toward them. Pay attention to them when they speak to you and call to you. And give them peace no matter what they're going through. I pray, God, that you will put your name upon them. Let them bear your name. That the world may know that we belong to you. And that you are a God who takes care of us. And I pray, God, for anyone who has made a decision this day to accept your blessing of your son. Engrave their name on the palms of your hands. Hallelujah. That they may be truly blessed in the days ahead. And when we gather and stand in your presence on the day of the Lord, I give you praise. We thank you. And it is in Jesus' name we ask these things. And everybody said, Amen.